Hello Oral Surgery colleagues and welcome to the Oral Surgery Podcast. I am your host Dr Richard Moore, an oral surgeon based in the United Kingdom. The aim of this podcast channel is to discuss ways of improving practice in oral surgery, thereby creating a better journey and patient experience and allowing us as clinicians to become better oral surgeons. All discussions on this channel are based on personal experience and opinions, which should be thought-provoking and supplemented with further research and evidence-based practice. Without further ado, let's jump into this podcast. Hello everybody and welcome to this podcast. I'm delighted to be joined by a colleague and good friend, Judith Stocker. So, good afternoon, Judith. Hi, Rich. So Judith is uh, a consultant maxillofacial surgeon in the UK and do you want to just give us a bit of a background about your kind of training and what your uh, specialty areas are within uh, maxillofacial surgery? Sure. Being a UK consultant uh, means, of course, that we're doubly qualified, uh, but I have uh, rather an interest in education, so I do a lot of teaching. Um, so that includes teaching our junior, de- junior dental colleagues, uh, but I also do teaching nationwide for people doing implants. Um, I have a private practice as well as my NHS practice. My NHS practice is largely um, trauma uh, and pretty much general maxillofacial surgery, uh, but my private practice is uh, a lot of implants and pre-prosthetic surgery and bone grafting and the like. Brilliant. Okay. So today we're going to talk a bit about post-op complications. And I think this is probably an area that um, frightens a lot of people and it'll be aimed at really, you know, not just specialist oral surgeons, but also perhaps those GDPs with an interest or anybody that's doing any kind of oral surgery work. And I think the the key areas probably are pain, bleeding, infection, common complications like dry sockets. Um, perhaps we'll touch on the antrum as well because OACs and mm-hmm. OAFs always crop up. And we'll perhaps finish talking about nerve injury, although, it, you know, that that's a fairly subspecialist area, but perhaps not managed as well as it could be in the UK. Um, so I, I guess common complications that I see, I mean, certainly in hospital and primary care, pain is a classic, swelling, um, bleeding not so much so, um, but certainly dry sockets, particularly with with a lot of students that we teach, that we do obviously have a high incidence of dry socket. And we see a lot of patients that come through the acute service that are, um, you know, poor dental attenders with poor oral hygiene. So uh, would you agree common complications that you might see slightly different in secondary care? I don't think we see much that's different, to be fair. Um, we see a, a group of patients, as indeed do you, who have uh, rather more complicated medical histories than perhaps some that are seen in primary care. Um, so I think one of the things that I would always teach is forewarned is forearmed. So as long as you are well aware of their medical history and all the other things that could go wrong, I think, yeah, I think bleeding is is not something we see because if we see patients who are uh, on anticoagulants or who are uh, have uh, other conditions uh, liver disease for example then we know in advance what we should do with them so stitching and packing so i think it's about it's it's um preparing yourself for all eventualities. Uh, but infections, we get a few infections after uh, or post-op oral surgery. Uh, we are, of course, changing our ways in, in, with respect to uh, antibiotics and oral surgery, uh, and that's a, probably a whole topic in itself. Uh, but dry sockets, I think we don't have a student population um, to uh, let uh, do our oral surgery. So I think where possible, uh, I think I think it's fair to say that our, our dry socket uh, risk is not high. It's certainly around the 1% mark, but I wouldn't put it any higher than that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, certainly you touched on bleeding there, and I think that's... Uh, I've done a podcast on bleeding, and it, there are fairly clear guidelines regarding antiplatelets, anticoags, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, the infections, I've, I've done an entire podcast with a couple of people about antibiotics, but we, mm-hmm. I think we, that's important that we touch on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we start with pain, because this is a classic, and again, it's something that patients should be warned about before you start. I, I certainly am of the adage that I give my patients ibuprofen if, if there's no contraindications and paracetamol before I start with my local. 
I think that's a great thing to do if you've got the facilities to do it. Um, in the secondary care sector in the big teaching hospital where I work, it's actually a bit more complicated to give somebody a uh, even a one-off dose of ibuprofen, even though it's a great thing to do. It's something that we do in, in um, primary care, however. I do that certainly for all my minor or surgery in primary care. Um, so I think it's a great time to do it, but it doesn't have to be done. Uh, and yeah. I think some some practices wouldn't have the facilities to do that. Yeah, um, so that's the time to, to think about it. But the other thing I would always say is warning your patients. If you prime your patients about how sore a procedure is going to be, then often they'll they'll, they'll they cope with it better. So in my consent form, I will put pain, swelling, bleeding, infection. So pain is the first one I'm going to put. So I warn them that they, they disappear off after their procedure. And the first thing they do as soon as they get home is, is take some a suitable analgesia, depending, of course, on their, um, um, their um, medical history. And what would... Um, sorry, I guess the first choice of analgesic, generally speaking, would be a non-steroidal. Would you agree with that? I agree, but I would also stand by the simple things. So uh, I would go uh, non-steroidal, but I would ask them to alternate it with uh, paracetamol. Uh, there's yeah. nothing wrong with paracetamol. Uh, and as long as you give your patients very strict instructions on how much they can take and when to take them, usually they're quite good at it. Yeah, and certainly those patients that, that come back with, with pain, um, you know, if or or if you're administrating uh, administering medications such as codiagramol or dihydrocodone, I think you've got to kind of think about, particularly in primary care, what kind of procedures are you doing that require an opioid based analgesic, and and if you are doing something that requires that, maybe that that should be done elsewhere. Um, I must or, confess, I would be re sorry, Rich. I would be really careful about dihydrocodone uh, yeah. in care it's it's something that it's it's not a very nice drug um it has a a, a worth sadly uh, mm. among some communities and uh, uh dihydrocodine is it's not the best painkiller for the kind of things that we do no no. And are much, much better. I think if you are going to use a small dose of codeine, then something like a, an eight milligrams of codeine and 500 milligram tablet of um, uh, paracetamol. So that would be the trade name for that would be cocodamol or something like cocodamol 8500. I think that's acceptable, but yeah. I wouldn't worry about dihydrocodine. And I think the other thing with the opioids, the dihydrocodone is sometimes patients develop that dependence, don't they, quite quickly? Yeah, um, and, and, and we do see some patients who come and they've taken quite a lot of codeine over several days uh, and then they tell you they feel terrible in and aside. Mm. And it turns out they feel terrible because the poor souls haven't opened their bowels for four or five days. Yeah, yeah. So it's not to be underestimated at the effect of codeine. And the other thing just to touch on is those patients that that don't appreciate the compound analgesics that have taken cocodamol, paracetamol and ibuprofen and yeah. that bit of education to say actually that cocodamol that there's two drugs in there and you've just doubled up your paracetamol so I think that's important I mean sometimes I, I say or I'll prescribe some codeine as a, a, a not a compound analgesic and say take this in the evening just as a bit of a breakthrough pain relief if, if I think it's going to be particularly bad but again you know most pain relief is controlled fairly well for oral surgery with ibuprofen and paracetamol. I think that's fair. The only times that I think patients really do suffer is the poor soul who's got um, alveolar osteitis, a dry socket. Sure, um, yeah. These are the kind of patients, as you know, who will come and see you. And it's almost like they've got this terrible look on their face that says, please give me a local anaesthetic to take this pain away. Yeah. And so I think a dose at night of codeine is actually quite a good idea. And, and the other thing that we can do for these patients, depending on the cause of their pain, is local anaesthetic or a block. I mean, particularly if it's a, a non-odontogenic pain and you're in the realms of trigeminal neuralgia, if you mm. can give a block with Marcaine or something, that, that mm. often binds them quite a, a bit of time while you can manage them appropriately with a referral or contact the GP or you know referral on to secondary care. And, and can I just add there, and thing about managing dry sockets is these things are incredibly tender. I mean, it's it's a horrible thing to have a dry socket. So I would always encourage people to give something. It could be Marcaine if you have access to it, but I think probably more of our, our, our Articaine might be better for our primary care colleagues. So giving somebody a lo local infiltration of Articaine is probably a very nice thing to do for the patients. Yeah.
Um, and peak pain, do you think, um, I guess depending what you've done, 24 hours, 48 hours post-op? Yeah. I think that's, I, I would always say you're not going to have the worst until 48 hours have gone. Yeah. And that applies to pain and to swelling. So patients will say, am I going to swell? How much is it going to swell? Well, you're not going to know really until 48 hours have passed. And everybody's different. Um, but I think going back to what I said earlier, if you uh, prime patients properly and you say, listen, this is going to be really sore. You're really not going to like me very much. Often they'll come back for a review and they'll say, do you know what? That wasn't as bad as you said it was going to be. At which point you, you've kind of done them a favor. You've primed them properly. Yeah, definitely. I think I always paint, paint the worst case scenario in some respects. Um, so swelling, other ways of much. So obviously pain comes with swelling and swelling comes with pain. Um, have you got any tips or tricks for managing? Because, you know, you see particularly... I don't know what company it is, but for osteotomies, they try and sell these um, yeah. cool pads that mm -hmm. you strap onto your face. They do work. There's actually some really good evidence for those. But I think, okay. and they use them, of course, my plastic surgery colleagues use them for some of their face, um, um, uh, face lift patients as well. Okay. So there are there is really good evidence for those. However, you've got to hire the machine. The patients have to hire the machine. And oh. then they pay for the disposables. Um, so a better way of getting around it would be these little disposable cool packs. You know, these things that have granules yeah. inside that you have to shake. Um, we have we give those out for all of our bigger oral surgery cases in primary care uh, and definitely okay. all implant cases. Um, and I, I also put a little bit in the post-op instructions urging caution with uh, ice, anything with ice in it. Mm. So if they're going to use a bag of peas, which is fine, make sure it's well wrapped because, of course, you can do yourself a damage with uh, something that's too, too cold. Um, yeah. The other thing I, I'm very fond of uh, also is these wheat packs. So in, in cases that might not be immediately post-op, one of these wheat packs that you put in the microwave to warm up conversely, particularly for TMJ pain, um, they're quite useful. Um, so they're not to be discounted either. But the cold packs are quite good. Did you say wheat or heat? Wheat. They're wheat. little wheat, wheaty bags. Um, oh, you can, okay. You can buy them just about anywhere. Um, chemists have them. I've even been in a garden yeah. centre them and it, it's, it's a wheat a bag of wheat grains of wheat that you stick in the oh. micro and that you warm them up they're brilliant for tmj pain and they're reusable and they're natural so there's no chemicals i mean the um uh, the ice bags the uh, the chemical things that you shake and agitate and they go free at uh, cold that's got chemicals in it so i'm sure lots of patients appreciate oh. the, the bags yeah I've, I've heard of the heat pads but i, I didn't know they were wheat um <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> and and you give that? Did you say for all of your implant patients or just the bigger cases? For the ice packs, the the chemical bags, I give to all my uh, major, more major oral surgery. Right. Anybody who's had bone graft, anybody yep. who's had implant, they all go home with them. And if they don't want to use them, and they're great for injuries at home. So if you've you know, running around in the garden and you sprain something, these these things are very useful to keep at home. And and you tell them to start that, irrespective of the outcome of the swelling. Do you start that that evening or? Do you use know, them regularly for everybody um okay. but it's about um you you look at your patients don't you and you there mm. are some patients who walk in the door and you think yeah, yeah, i'm afraid you're gonna swell yeah. uh, and it's a terrible thing to say it's the redheads because we, we anecdotally always say redheads bleed but sometimes they do um but there are some patients who'll come and you'll think yeah, you've got really delicate skin you're just gonna swell so uh, it, it depends it depends it, it, interesting you say anecdotally about um I'm going to say fair-haired the population, uh, bleeding. There is an article in the BMJ, I think it's written by an anaesthetist, saying... It's a few uh, years ago, saying that there's no blood abnormality. Is that the one you're thinking yeah, of? Yeah, but that they do bleed. And, yeah. you know, and, it, it's and true, isn't it? It absolutely is true. And and we it's something that we, we do. You, the patient walks in the door. Of course, I always get caught up by the, the, uh, the girls who've walked in and actually their hair is not their own natural colour. And Indeed, I assume yeah. But uh, yeah, redheads will often ooze a little more. And what's your opinion on prescription of or administration of steroids for prevention of swelling, depending on procedure? 
I think it depends on the procedure. I certainly have no issue in a small dose of steroid, certainly if we're giving patients um, intravenous sedation. So mm. my uh, sedationist uh, will ask me prior to administering sedation if, if it's going to be prolonged, would I like a small dose of dexamethasone? And uh, so we'll do that for those patients, but not for anybody who's undergoing routine stuff under local anaesthetic. Okay. It's interesting, isn't it? Because certainly all my GA patients get eight milligrams of dex, but that's really is an anti, the anti-emetic from the anaesthetic yeah. side. And, and, so and it's a bit... We've actually moved away from that, curiously, oh. in the AK setting in the hospitals where I work. Uh, there are very few patients we now give that to. Um, so I think it was... I think it was probably something that we used to give a lot more when with mm. some of the older um, general anaesthetic agents. Um, so it's not something we give to every patient. Okay. I mean, I do give it orally for um, bigger cases like uh-huh. full arch or zygos, but um, not, and I'll give it IV if, if I'm doing a sedation case. Um, but again, it's not something that I give regularly. Certainly in the States, they give it locally to the site after whizzies. So they'll inject it into the buccal mucosa. Uh, I, I've got no experience of any evidence to, to relate to that. Have you, do you have the evidence there's, to support There's a that? couple of papers I'd have to trawl my Dropbox, though. Um, and I, I don't do it, um, I'll be honest. But um, it's something that I keep thinking I should look at. But I think you also should look at our American colleagues. They have a slightly different training to us. They do an yeah, awful lot more anesthesiology, as they would say. Yeah, yeah. So they are much hotter on that sort of thing. Uh, and, of course, a lot of their surgery is principally office-based. So even yeah. some of the otomies are office-based. So they're a lot more used to it than we are. Yeah. Um, and I think it, I would struggle to persuade my primary care practices that we should be keeping uh, steroids in the practice just for the purpose of giving that because usually yeah. I don't find it a problem well there's probably a short supply since covid isn't there because dex yeah. was the exactly the drug of choice yeah okay so i think um i think from a, a swelling pain perspective and um, we'll come on to dry socket in a bit but I, I don't know is there anything else you want to add to that little section i think it's very useful for primary care practitioners certainly to acquaint themselves with the analgesic ladder principle yeah the who um, yeah, the IWHA um, uh, thing. It, it used to be the case that everybody was very keen on, on the, the dihydrocoding. The, in, in the UK, it's DF118. Uh, but also they were very keen on codidromol and coproximal. Now, coproximal has disappeared, but I don't think codidromol is much better. Um, and there are much easier ways of managing things than going straight for the biggest drug. Um, yeah. And it's all about... Isn't I'm it? Gonna say, it's the same with naproxen, isn't it? You know, you mm-hmm. often get a patient who's been to A and E, come back, and they've got codeine, naproxen, yeah. and it's all fairly hardcore stuff. With, yeah. I, I, I'm not aware that on there's any strong evidence to suggest things like naproxen or diclofenac are any better than ibuprofen in oral surgery. I'm not aware of anything for oral surgery. Certainly for the rheumatology patients, naproxen is more favoured these yeah. days. The only other thing I would add for our primary care colleagues is just to be a little bit cautious about patients um, with uh, ibuprofen, so non-steroidals in the older age group. Mm, Acute sure. kidney inj- injury is one of these things that um, our dental colleagues probably don't know much about. Uh, and this is a, a kidney injury that's caused by non-steroidals quite commonly. And even in hospitals, it's something that we weren't really well aware of until the last, I don't know, seven or eight years Um, and if you put somebody on quite a dose of um, ibuprofen even and you do that for a couple of weeks you it's perfectly feasible for you to uh, tip a kidney that was failing into a kidney that has failed yeah and i guess the other thing to mention with a maybe longer than a week's course is to consider a proton pump inhibitor yeah for your non-steroidal I think that would be very sensible, but of course our uh, primary care GDP colleagues won't be able to prescribe that. They will, however, be able to advise the patient to either go to their GP, but of course a lot of PPIs can be bought over the counter now. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I always advise people to take painkillers with food where possible, uh, and if there's any history of them having any uh, dyspepsia or anything with non-steroidals, then they probably should avoid them. Avoid, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Okay, bleeding which oh, I always get asked about bleeding as a hot topic. And I think there are some, 
obviously you would assess the patient's bleeding risk from their medical history and their um, their drug history. So antiplatelets, anticoagulants, self-explanatory really. And we'll touch on those in a sec. But, you know, when patients say, oh, last time I had a tooth out or something at the dentist, you know, I bled cupfuls. And I think they always, well, maybe not always exaggerate, but that mixture of blood and saliva is always a classic. Yeah. But also there are some key questions that I know you are fairly keen to ask about yeah. things that have happened in the past. I think the story about the cupfuls of blood is, is a bit akin to the, the dentist had his knee on my chest when he took his, my tooth out kind of thing. Indeed. So I, 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 it's not that I take these things with a pinch of salt, but my next questions to the patients then, well, okay, so you've had a bleeding tooth socket. Have you ever had any other operations? Have you had any kind of surgery at all? And so for ladies in particular, I would ask about anything, any gynecological procedures or obstetric procedures. Uh, and of course, I would ask all patients, have you had your tonsils out? So if you haven't had a bleeding problem with tonsillectomy, um, childbirth, for example, or they don't have any serious problems with uh, periods, then they are unlikely to have a bleeding problem. That's not to say yeah. they might not have a bleeding problem. I have seen somebody who managed to get through a um, total abdominal hysterectomy who had von Willebrands, who then mm. subsequently bled post uh, wisdom teeth and then was found to have von Willebrands. Um, so it, it's not foolproof that, but it's something that you should ask about. Sure. And then obviously, you know, the other things, if, if you, I mean, I always say to, to men and maybe some women, if you're having a shave and you cut yourself, does it does it heal up fairly quickly and do you bruise easily those kind of classic things but on top of all that we've got the medical conditions that you should be aware of such as liver disease i, I think people always get a little bit twitchy with mm -hmm. oh you know either alcohol dependence or liver disease should i do clotting should i not do clotting do i need to refer them it's a common what? cause of referrals to the hospital service so the patients will um take the, the dentist rather will take the history from the patient and they'll elicit a history of alcohol excess. And uh, the patient, it might be uh, needs extraction in hospital, patient drinks excessively. Well, the two don't necessarily follow one from the other. What I would say is that a patient who drinks to excess, who does have a clotting disorder, is highly likely to be known to our um, uh, hepatology colleagues. It's not necessarily true, but it's highly likely. Um, and I think it's something to be a bit cautious about. So use the other questions to supplement the stuff about how much do you drink. Uh, and if they're going to have a problem with uh, uh, liver disease related bleeding, they'll usually have some other signs or symptoms related to liver disease. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, and then other conditions that, you know, you would, patients who've got ITP usually know, don't they? Yeah. Or um chronic so renal failure just a, a, for, for uh, richard's code for idiopathic thrombos thrombocytopenia yeah sorry i'm assuming knowledge <laughs> um and then those medications risk of bleeding i mean the sdcep guidelines the scottish dental guidelines um are, are really clear and they they identify those medications and the obvious ones are obviously antiplatelets anticoagulants mm -hmm. cytotoxic drugs long long-term non-steroidals Mm -hmm. um etc so do refer to those and i'll put a link in the podcast to the the scottish guidance for if anybody's not seen them and again if you listen to this and you're outside of the uk you may have different guidance um in, in your country i mean the common antiplatelets in this country are aspirin clopidogrel dipyridamol um prasugrel and ticagrelor there is a, another one on the market called cangrelor and certainly you know single dose 75 milligram aspirin uh, the guidance is just to treat them as normal. You might want to limit their treatment. Um, but certainly dual antiplatelets or the things like the clopidogrel, they do bleed, don't they? And I, I certainly would encourage packing and stitching those patients and limiting the treatment. And I think the thing to be aware of is that you're not actually either lengthening your procedure too much or causing the patient undue harm by packing and stitching. So sure. when in doubt, packing and stitching, uh, assuming you've got the skill to do so and the, the, the packing to pack in it, um, is, is not an unreasonable thing to do where you're, not, where yeah. you're a bit worried. And, and also a word of caution that some of the resolvable hemostatic agents on the market, some are um, animal uh, in nature. So obviously your patient needs to be consented for that. Mm. And um, I mean, I tend to use PRF platelet-rich fibrin that we've now got in the hospital. So that, that helps as well. 
but do be, yeah, be... oh well you see yeah, you get yourself some funding um I and then um I, I was gonna touch on bone wax because i know that you and i or i <laughs> <laughs> Had to, I thought that would generate some some entertainment. Uh, I um, when I was Judith's uh, junior, uh, recall putting rather a lot of bone wax somewhere. You're a redhead, but... seriously. Sorry. He was a redhead. Oh. <laughs> and um, bone yeah, wax is brilliant stuff if you've got it. Bone wax is really good um, for a single bleeding vessel. Um, it's the, when you do lift a flap for a third, lower third molar, there are patients that you will see, uh, and you may have seen this, Rich. Have you ever seen that little blood vessel you'll see? I yeah, a, actually, blood. it's funny you mentioned it. My registrar only two weeks ago, we looked at the scan because uh, they'd had a scan for this impact today, uh -huh. and there was a retromolar canal, yeah. and lo and behold, it spurted, yeah. and he just popped a, a tiny bit of bone wax on. A, Problem solved. And that's the that's the best place, in my opinion, for bone wax. Yeah. Uh, the other place you could use it is if you are trying to go through the uh, the wall of the antrum to do whatever you wanted to do in the antrum. Sure. As you know, sometimes you will find a black vessel. Um, and if you didn't have bone wax, actually, that's a point. If you didn't have bone wax, what else could you use, Rich? I turn this into a test. Oh, for for the antrum. Yeah. Or just generally. Well, somebody asked me this question the other day, and I thought, well, actually, there are some of these disposable pens that you can buy. Have you ever seen these things? Um, it's a, uh, a little, pen. yeah, a little cautery pen. Yeah, um, we used to have them in the hospital, but um, I don't, I haven't used one for years. I, I guess well, you've got to be cautious where that bleeding's coming from in case there's, you know, a absolutely. neurovascular bundle. Absolutely. But these things you can buy on the internet for about eight quid each. And for the sake of having a tiny bit of cautery mm. um, in your drawer, as it were, uh, in your little armamentarium, I think they're a useful thing to have. However, there's always a but. And the yeah. but is that you need to use these things really carefully because if you apply them willy nilly, then you're, you're in danger of burning something local as well. Yeah. Uh, as putting out your bleeding. Uh, we use a great thing called a hyfricator. Um, which is a uh, little little trolleyed, wheeled trolleyed cart that um, it's quite expensive. In the UK, it's about three and a half thousand pounds. But if you're doing these things regularly and you can either attach a monopolar force or you can attach oh. a monopolar to it, it's a brilliant little thing. Oh, that's handy, yeah. And I, I guess the other kind of thing just to mention is if, if the patient's on an antiplatelet or anticoagulant, you know, you mm -hmm. need to know the reason they're on that because that might come with other complications as well. Um, and would you stop your antiplatelet agents out of curiosity? Say that again, sorry? Would you stop the antiplatelet agent? No. The, the Scottish guidance for dual antiplatelet or single antiplatelet is not to stop. Just a question. I have lots of dental... Um, my, my referrers will say that they're, they're, well, the patients will come and they'll say that their dentist had told them to stop their uh, plate, their antiplatelet agent. Oh. Uh, it's not something I would encourage. Yeah. The, the only one to stop is one of the DOAX. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's rather oxivan if they're high risk of bleeding, so you miss the morning dose, restart yeah. it in the afternoon. But, you know, if any, any doubt, then um, speak to the prescribing physician, really. Agreed. Um, so bleeding, it, it you know... I was always taught by an anaesthetic colleague of ours, it, it'll stop one way or another, um, which is true. But ideally, you know, um, you don't want your patient exsanguinating, uh, which we've both seen. Um, but, idea, you know, in the first six to 12 hours, that clot should form and it should be fairly, um, fairly firm, shouldn't it? And if it breaks down for whatever reason, we've then got post-operative bleeding. So managing that post-op bleed, I guess in primary care, care it, you might not have to do it. it. Depends what kind of on call or out of hours service that you run. But certainly in the hospital, when these patients come in, you know, late in the evening, they're fed up, aren't they? They've mm. it's it's horrible having a bleeding socket or oozing from your mouth. So it's being able to triage that patient that you need to see. And I think if the patient's phoned up and said, "I'm still bleeding," you are obliged to see them. Whether you, um, I mean, you might give them advice about pressure for half an hour and then call me back. And, and hopefully it w will have stopped in that 30 minutes as long as they've sat down, rested. They've either used the pack you've given them or a dry tea bag, sit down and wait and time 30 minutes. But if, if it's still bleeding after that, you think you've got to see them really, haven't you? 
You do. And I'm, I'm pleased to hear you mention the tea bag. I thought that was something that had died. Um, the tea bag is very, very old fashioned, but it, it does actually work, although I would wrap it in a gauze before you used it. Um, patients who bleed, you, what you have to do when you're triaging is, is weed out the ones who really just want it to stop, but really haven't done very much to stop it themselves. Um, I would I always send them home with advice about not using straw because that's quite a useful one. Sometimes patients yeah. assume because they've had oral surgery that they need to use a straw, but actually that's just going to encourage bleeding. And the other thing that I'm very keen to encourage is um, some patients go out and you know that they're going to keep spitting because they mm. don't like the taste of the blood and they're going to keep spitting stuff out and then they are going to bleed. Um, but you're right. These patients come to you late at night. They're fed up. They're miserable. Um, they, they just want it to stop. Um, so in the hospital service, we have the ability to do a clotting screen. And that's the useful thing to do. So it's about stitching, packing. For us, it's about a clotting, clotting screen. But of course, for the, uh, the novel uh, oral anticoagulants, you can't do that. Mm. Um, so it's really a question of making them comfy and making sure they're not bleeding too much. Yeah. And I think the key is to, if you can get in there, get rid of that clot that's in there, have a good look and try and identify if it is something you could control either with your little bipolar or your, your bone wax um, and maybe a bit of local just to make it a bit more comfortable. Obviously, there's that cautionary tale. If you're giving local with a vasoconstrictor, it's obviously going to help the hemostasis, but it might be that, that when that wears off, you're back to square yeah. one. Um, it is but rare, and, isn't it, that we see yeah. anything that's serious. However, there are some terrible cases out there of patients who've come to significant harm yeah. from bleeding from a dental socket. So it's not true for people to say, oh, it's only a bleeding tooth socket, sadly. Um, people yeah. with bleeding tooth sockets do occasionally come to harm. And, and if they've been referred into you, would you routinely, would you get your juniors routinely to do bloods if they've been admitted? I think if they're admitted, I think it's appropriate for them to have bloods. Um, It is most unlikely you'll find anything in those bloods, but you've got an opportunity when the patient comes through the emergency department to do some investigations, and I think it's appropriate that you do. In the same way that when we admit somebody with an infection, you've got an opportunity to see whether this patient is diabetic, and I think it's appropriate to do. And um, certainly in our trust, and this is routine for our hematology patients, and I guess guess the other thing just to mention is those patients with underlying hematological problems, clotting like von Willebrand's or haemophilia, then it's mandatory to get your hematologist involved with that because they do need to be managed appropriately. Um, We have a fantastic nurse-led service. Yeah, Um, we do as well. And I think that's that's probably similar across the country, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, so these patients are these days well worked up. I mean, you and I both have memories of years gone by where that wasn't necessarily the case. Indeed. Um, these days, the specialist nurses come and sort everything out. And actually, we tend to keep those patients overnight just in case. Right. And actually, our patients go back to the hematology ward. They look after them. That's how good well, they are. We have um, that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're very keen on tranexamic acid, and they seem to prescribe that um, for both pre-op and post-op sometimes with the haemophilia patients. And I know people always ask me about, oh, you know, should we have TXA in the practice? It's not something I kind of advise, because the, the other thing you could do with a bleeding socket is your adrenaline ampule, which you would use for anaphylaxis. You can crack one of those, pop it on some gauze, and use that as pressure with the vasoconstrictor, but it might only be a short-term measure. But well, certainly I, I don't think... Sorry, Rich. I think that's very appropriate. I think uh, the, there are things that you can do in primary care and there are things you shouldn't need to do in primary care. So once you've exhausted your skill set and your knowledge base, it's time for somebody else to deal with it. So I think most of my primary care colleagues probably wouldn't be very happy to to start um, using tranexamic acid. I yeah. think there are people who would, but I yeah. think if it, at the stage where it's really not doing what you think it should, it's time to call for help. Yeah. Um, and it's getting that TXA as a mouthwash um, mm. made up, isn't it? Because it's not, I don't think it's licensed. It isn't. And not every pharmacy would be happy to stock it. Um, so, and yeah, it, and I think if you're thinking of that, there's obviously a reason you need it. So, And it did used to come in glass vials as well, didn't it? Yeah, for IV. I, I assume it still does. Yeah, it um, does. And then, um, then you have the problem of how you get them open. I've certainly seen somebody cut themselves on a glass vial of Tranexamic. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Um, so yeah, so bleeding's quite, um, I think key is in the history and then obviously mm. management for that acute bleed, mm. which, you know, you touched on infection with that and, and admission and things. So I think we'll, we'll move on to infection. There are some at risk groups. And I, th- I think one of the things we need to, to mention now is, is sepsis, which is very much in the public domain, but certainly those patients who are at risk of an infection. And I think it's important to be able to distinguish between swelling and infection because you get that classic patient who comes back and says, oh, I've got an infection, they've got a big fat face, but actually that's post-op swelling or edema. Whereas infection, you need to identify that and make sure that you've identified the differences between swelling and infection. Sometimes age, extremities of age, certainly the elderly population might be more at risk. Smokers, you know, concurrent medical issues such as steroids, immunosuppression, radiotherapy, diabetes we've talked about. Um, so it's recognizing those patients before you operate to identify that they may be at risk of infection. Sure. But also... I, I... Sorry, I keep cutting in on you. I do. That's all right. Um, I think it, it, it's, uh, as we talked about at the beginning, it's forewarned, isn't it? So the diabetic that comes in, and, and don't forget, patients that walk through our doors these days, we see so many type 2 diabetics or people who are on the threshold of being, oh, I'm almost type 2 diabetic, doctor. I'm nearly there. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to give those people antibiotics in situations that require it. Um, but again, as you say, it's, it's, it's assessing that patient. Is it swelling? Is it an infection? So is it hot? Is the patient unwell? Um, do they have any signs of pus anywhere? Is the tissue... There's a difference, isn't there, Rich, between a, a swollen um, sort of cheek, for example, yeah. and an infected one. There's a texture difference. So uh, edema is tends to be a bit squishy, whereas if you have uh, infection, it tends to be a bit more. The, the word we like is indurated. Um, mm. so it's got a firmness to this to it. Is that fair? Yeah, definitely. And and recognizing, uh, you know, I'll ask you in a second about those patients that uh, you know you would think are a red flag. They need to be either in the back of a yellow truck with blue lights on or definitely need to send them to hospital fairly soon. But that recognition of sepsis, and there's a really good paper that, again, I'll put a link to in the BDJ that Paul Coulthard wrote with some colleagues, I can't remember the other authors, looking at, you know, the the recognising the symptoms and signs of sepsis in primary care, like slurred speech or confusion, Mm -hmm. shivering, um, not, not passing urine, shortness of breath. They have that sometimes sense that they, they really don't feel well at all their skin might be discolored as well so it's it's recognizing that early on and managing it early early and there's that sepsis six when they come into hospital that people need to jump on but from a primary care practitioner people always say to me oh i don't know when to refer this patient rich what should i when should i pick up that phone or when should i prescribe some antibiotics and bring them back or give them a call the next day and i think there are probably some key pointers from your perspective as to which ones you need to see pronto. We worry about anybody with an elevated pulse, so somebody who is sufficiently unwell to be tachycardic, and it's a good practice to actually take somebody's pulse. It's not a problem. It's good practice for you to have a thermometer in the practice, and so if you can take their temperature and their pyrexic, then it's not unreasonable for you to pick up a telephone and actually speak to somebody. If they're having difficulty speeching, uh, and the classic speech that we really hate is something that we call hot potato speech. Um, so, uh, and what we mean by that is basically the tongue's not moving very well. The tongue is often raised, the floor of mouth, if you look inside the mouth, the floor of mouth will be raised in edematous. And the tongue doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It's not sort of agile as it as it needs to be. Um, and if I thought about that, then that's probably what we call hot potato speech. Um, if they have any difficulty swallowing, uh, and in particular if they are actually drooling saliva, then that's absolutely good reason to pick up a telephone and have a conversation with somebody. Um, we also are not very keen on swelling that starts to affect the eye, so the periorbital area, um, but it's airway, uh, eye, swallowing, breathing. Oh, have I missed anything out? Have I missed anything? I think out? maybe just, yeah, neck swelling sp- and rapidly yeah. spreading infection, and you know. The other thing I, I that think... Was, mm, carry on. Go on. No, no, you, you go. <laughs> the other thing that we really, really don't like uh, is redness on the neck. So if you have somebody who's got a spreading infection on the neck and you can see that the skin is red, 
um, that's something that really uh, concerns us. And actually, also, if the skin looks like it might have been red or it's swollen, but it stops blanching, so it gets this very unusual texture to it and it stops blanching or even becomes mottled, uh, that's a really alarming sign for us uh, of something called necrotizing fasciitis. Um, so that's time to pick up a telephone. Yeah. Um, I, and people always say, oh, you know, oh, they've got Ludwig's angina. But I think realistically, it's not necessarily the label, is it? It's the clinical signs and symptoms yeah. that you recognize that are the red flags that they need to go into hospital. We don't see that many Ludwig's anginas. So Ludwig's angina is a, um, a an infection whereby you get swelling essentially around your upper airway. So we're talking base of tongue, uh, so submandibular, sublingual, base of tongue, um, and it can often be peritonsillar as well. So these are people whose airways will start to be a problem. Uh, they can't speak. They get the classic hot potato speech. Um, and uh, we treat them by um, using a, a tracheostomy. Uh, they get lots of big incisions in their neck to let out what you think is going to be pus, but actually often isn't. But we actually don't see very many of them. So I think it's it's not about diagnosing a Ludwig's angina. It's about you saying this patient's got difficulty swallowing, this patient's got difficulty speaking, or this patient is drooling, or they just look unwell. Uh, and it's fine to pick up the phone. Yeah. And I think um, it's really important to pick up the phone rather than, um, well, I don't think people write letters anymore, do they? But rather than giving the patient a letter and bundling them off and saying, make, make your way to A&E and just give this to the receptionist. Absolutely. I think having, a, having a conversation with whoever's on call for MaxVax in the hospital mm -hmm. is really important to hand that patient over. And to end on infection, I think there's a favorite saying that you and I both know, which is <laughs> never let the sun set on pus. Plus. And it's it's interesting. We've got some overseas students on our master's program and I got them to present about infection. And one of them said that as well. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And it's not just in the UK that that saying is is well known. So it's universal. Well, it, it's a truism, isn't it? It's, yeah, uh, definitely. And if, if anybody in theatre tries to say to us, um, well, we haven't got enough space in the theatre tonight for the emergencies. You'll just have to wait till tomorrow. Um, no. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to do that. We'll we'll do yeah. the surgery tonight. Thanks very much. Um, great. Okay, so dry socket or alveolar osteitis for those uh, that want the the proper term, which is either the clot hasn't formed correctly or it, it's disintegrated very prematurely in that socket. So you've got pretty much what it says on the tin, a dry socket. And you know this, if you look in the literature, it's up to five percent of extractions, and we know that. There's contributing factors which can be trauma, difficult extraction, that mechanical damage as a result of excessive force increases the risk of releasing inflammatory mediators that then obviously um, may induce that conversion of plasminogen to plasmin um, and then that acts to dissolve that blood clot. Smokers, uh, it says in some of the literature nutrient deficiencies or immunocompromised, I, I, I'm not I'll run with that for the minute. Uh, the oral contraceptive pill in females, and usually the mandible's more affected than the maxilla. So, again, I, I think inexperienced operators is is a classic as well. But also mm. those patients with poor oral hygiene, dental neglect, they're much more at risk of of dry socket. Uh, it's interesting that you, your student group has a higher incidence of um, dry socket than perhaps we would normally expect. Yeah, but I mean though. That data is from patients coming to the acute clinic, which are patients that don't have GDPs. Oh, right. So it might be slightly biased. Yeah, a slightly um, different patient group, haven't you? Yeah, it's a diff different population cohort. So, um, And then there's, there's lots of studies looking at how we manage this, and certainly how we manage it is they may, as you touched on earlier, they may need some local anesthetic. Make sure you've got your diagnosis from your history, and it's usually that pain that is is fairly well localized and it is just not controlled with over the counter analgesia. Um I, I sometimes give local anesthetic if it's really uncomfortable. Some people might argue and say, well, you know, you're causing vasoconstriction, it might cause further uh risk with that 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 clot. But actually I think if it's that sore and you can't get in there, then you, you've got to give them some local, haven't you? I think that's just the kind thing to do. Uh, and yeah. yeah, I accept that there might be a bit of vasoconstriction, but I think that's the kind thing to do. Yeah. And then we irrigate with saline. There was a time when we used chlorhexidine, but since you know the risk of anaphylaxis or certainly um, reactions to chlorhexidine and open sockets, we've, we've steered well, well away from that. 
Sure. I still find that people are being taught chlorhexidine uh, irrigation. Um, it's a it's a curious thing. It's not something that I was ever taught, so I, I was I've never been used to it. I've always used normal saline. Yeah. Um, and of course, there are some cases, as you and I are both aware, which ended in tragedy uh, yeah. as a result of chlorhexidine um, allergy. And it's interesting uh, that uh, our orthopedic colleagues used to use well. They went from using betadine as a skin prep to chlorhexidine as a skin prep, and now some of them are moving backwards again because chlorhexidine allergy appears to be a bit more of a thing than it ever was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I agree. I, I would use uh, normal saline. And and then we pack with alva gel, which I think is fairly routine. Now it's yeah. interesting that there was some research that came out in 2020, and Alistair Sloan actually is on the paper from Cardiff, who's now uh -huh. at, at Melbourne. And they, they were looking at a, a novel dual action monolithic thermo setting hydrogel loaded, and this is the key, with lignocaine and metronidazole. And you know, we're taught from you know the year dot, aren't we? This is not an infection, it's not anti, it's not a microbial problem, it's no antibiotics. And they got some results from this saying that actually um that this there seems to be some benefit of the use of lignocaine and metronidazole providing pain relief and any pathological bacteria now whether that's then the dry socket exacerbating to an infection is difficult to say from the research but it's interesting that that's out there and, it, and it's fairly recent and out of curiosity I, I you you've made me aware of this paper but has there been a similar paper done but without the metronidazole in the hydrogel not that i'm aware of because this, I would this be was done at cardiff yeah, I'd be interested to know whether it was just the protection, protecting, it's mm. covering the, the really painful bone surface that's the issue, or whether it's the antibiotic that makes it better. Yeah, yeah. Curiosity. But it's a blooming horrible thing for patients to have. Oh, yeah, it is, yeah. And, and uh, certainly the other thing to mention is if, you know, we say to patients, you might need to come back in 24, 48 hours for it to be redressed. That's fine. Mm. Um, and certainly in our, in our hospital, we are very cautious if they come back a third time then i would be considering is this actually alveolar osteitis because it, it's self-limiting it should have got better or be getting better if it's not getting better then we need to be thinking about a surgical serve and differential here and is this something it's a red flag is in it a non-healing socket it is i think it's it's a rarity it's a serious rarity um the only thing i would be a bit cautious about and, and i have seen previously is the socket that fails to heal because so much of gel has been put in the socket under pressure yeah. um i think it's one of these things that you should pack loosely into a socket and Definitely. it's not something that i would be for want of a better word ramming into the socket and plugging um uh, and i have actually had to explore a socket um it was a, a th lower third molar curiously um, and the lady ended up with numbness as a result, um, oh. as a post-op complication. And when I biopsied the, the tissue at the apex, it came back with lots of fibres in it. And then it was only then we realised it was alveolar. Oh, okay. um, so her numbness did eventually improve, but the supposition right. was that it was an exposed nerve that had been somewhat traumatised with a, a good plug. Of yeah. Interesting. And and then, you know, there's some literature to support if you put PRF in the socket after your extraction, you're probably going to prevent alveolar osteitis. And do you think that's true? Yeah, definitely. And is that what you do in your uh, your own practice? Yeah, routinely, unless they don't want it. And or, do you do you have a dry socket rate? Um, I haven't audited it since we started. <laughs> Um, but we will be soon. In the trust, we've only just got the machine coming. Um, but privately, because um, I don't do that many extractions privately, it's more implants. It, it's uh, I certainly should look at it. But it, yeah, anecdotally, I, I, I do audit my dry sockets for my yeah. private extractions because, as you know, I do quite a lot of extractions privately. Yeah. Uh, and my dry socket rate, rate is less than half percent, but <clears throat> it, I, I'm irritated every time i get one not only for the patient but i mean it, mm. it ruins my data too but um, <laughs> it's um it's just one of these things that you do your best it doesn't matter mm. how atraumatic your extraction is yeah and the classic is the lower root treated six um mm. that you're taking out pre-implant and you try to be gentle and then just occasionally you'll get a dry socket yeah 
Um, so um, I'd be interested to know what the PR, your P, your personal PRF audit okay. is. Okay, watch this space. Uh, okay, so you've just mentioned nerve injury, but we'll we'll just touch on iatrogenic damage, which is um, something obviously we want to try and avoid at all costs. Mm. Certainly, a pet hate of mine, and I know this might rub some people up the wrong way, is surgical emphysema. And we had a, I think it was last year, we had a systematic review published in the BDJ looking at uh, surgical emphysema due to dental treatment so yeah. this is when air is getting into the soft tissues and I, and I i know i'm fully aware that people section teeth decoronate them with an air rotor um I, personally i think it's indefensible and that, that's just my take on it i appreciate I them I, sorry I, I, just, I can't support it uh, it's just not something i can support at all um i know that an air rotor is a very useful tool but uh when it comes to exodonture i don't think it's the tool of choice yeah and and people will argue and say, well, if I'm doing a subgingival crown prep, what's the difference? But I think if you're purposefully either removing bone or or sectioning a tooth, then yes. that to me is a surgical procedure in itself. That um, I, yeah, I, I totally agree. I appreciate that some general dental practitioners don't have a surgical motor, mm. and that there is a cost implication for that. But you know, it's not a huge cost implication. And and certainly the other thing is you can get reverse air exhaust, uh, reverse air exhaust air rotors, yeah. which is common practice in the states. So yeah. you know if you do see stuff on YouTube or on social media, it's completely different. Um, but it's not doesn't seem to be common practice in in the UK. Now on our review, nobody died, but the 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 outcome generally for these patients is at least 24 hours on ITU may be mm. ventilated with supportive therapy, which can sometimes include inotropes, um, mm. ventilated and uh, steroids and antibiotics. So, you know, nobody wants to land on critical care for a night unless they, I, if it's preventable. In my now 30 years, I've seen two of these patients, um, um, both of whom had air in the sort of pericardial sac. Mm. Um, it's not a good thing. Um, no. Yeah. So it's I entirely can't. preventable. I think that's the bottom line for me. Um, and then other common iatrogenic things like, you know, um, heat injuries. You know, it happens. It, it's probably more classic in, in general anaesthetic setting because you sometimes you're not conscious of, of where the, the handpiece is. I mean, certainly the, the surgical motors don't seem to get that hot, but it, it still happens, doesn't it? Or the burr gets wrapped around some soft tissue. Yeah. Uh, so it's something to just be cautious of, really. Um, I, as you know, because you and I have worked together before, um, I have a real issue about patient protecting patients' lips with retractors. Mm. So um, it's beholden on you, particularly when the patient is asleep, to protect that patient's soft tissues. Uh, to some extent, I think it's a little easier when the patients are awake, uh, or you, you you pay more attention yeah. to it. Yeah. The patients are awake. Um, but you and I have both seen some really nasty lip mm. injuries um, and uh, patients don't do well with these injuries. Um, they, um, they react very badly to them uh, in lots of ways. Uh, yeah. And it's all preventable. It's incredibly preventable. But it's things like um, uh, one of uh, a practice um, that I'm aware of was using surgical drills, uh, surgical uh, drill bits that were too long for the handpiece. So you end uh, up with a long piece of rotating instrument uh, and that's going to get caught up in tissues. It, it, it's yeah. not worth it. Um, and we were talking, talking about iatrogenic uh, injuries. I think choosing the right piece of kit for the right job will help you stop making any iatrogenic injuries. Uh, and as you and I have to discussed before, I've got a bugbear about round burr versus straight fissure burr, um, and I prefer the latter, as you know. Mm. Uh, that, again, is about preventing iatrogenic damage. Uh, you, yeah. you shouldn't have to take huge amounts of bone away from patients to uh, jaws to take teeth out. It's just not necessary. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to use an Optrigate and a Minnesota retractor, in, and the Minnesota is parallel to my handpiece, so it's almost... Yeah. Um, the fulcrum or resting on that and I just like the Minnesota for that reason things like rate retractors I think are, are, are more prone to cause iatrogenic damage even to your flap I would rather use a Minnesota any day than a rake yep. uh, there yep. are some rakes out there that are okay because they have slightly gentler teeth some of them have mm. really 
teeth. And the Optrigate, I've used too. Um, I think there's something that you have to get used to. I think there's something you have to use regularly. Um, yeah. And um, the patients look a bit alarmed sometimes when you produce this thing but i think they're quite good yeah if, if they um, smile or laugh you've had it because it shoots across the room but that's if true. they're asleep it, top tip if they're asleep you need to get it on before you your anesthetist connects their tube um <laughs> so i'm always poised as soon as they've come into theater to to throw my octrogate over the airway um i've never used them i must confess in their sleep patient i've only used they're them. a bit fiddly when they're asleep um gotcha. But they, they do make a big difference. The, the only issue is sometimes if you work it anteriorly, they do get in the way. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to the antrum, which is um, is common uh, another common question, you know, tuberosity fractures, uh, oral antral communications. Tuberosity fractures, I've seen one really nasty one that, that bled heaps that came in when I was a junior. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't know what your experience is, but quite often people will say, well, if, if the tooth comes with the tuberosity and it's bleeding a lot, keep it on the forceps and put it back in to plug the hole. Um, I don't know what your thoughts on that are, providing it doesn't go into the antrum, obviously. I think if it's a very big fragment, I think that's for some of our primary care colleagues, I think that's a useful approach. Um, I think if your skill set includes it, a lot of us, if it's not too large a piece, will actually take the piece of tuberosity out with the tooth. Yeah. Uh, but that does entail quite a lot more dissection. And it can leave a slightly unusual shaped tuberosity, of course, because you've, you've got a deformity at the end. Um, I think I find sometimes the guidance about uh, if the tuberosity is going to break, put the tooth back in and, and then bring the patient back another day. I, I find myself frustrated with that guidance sometimes insofar as, well, the patient might still be in pain uh, and then you're hoping that that um, tuberosity fracture is going to heal when you and I both know that if you put some pressure on that in six weeks or eight weeks' time, it's probably going to break again. It's just yeah. somebody else is going to break it. Um, I think forewarned is forearmed here. Um, I think anybody, when you look at a, 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 an X-ray of somebody's uh, eight and a tuberosity, the shape of it is critical. If it looks like a table, it's going to behave like a table and it'll probably break. So if it's got yeah. three, a back, a top and a side on the tooth socket, then it's probably going to come off. If it's slightly more pointy or rounded, I think you're, you'd be unlucky. Um, but I mean, by and large, if it's a small fracture, I'll take it, take it out with the tooth. Mm. Yeah. Do. yeah. And, and certainly these patients, you know, if it, that then may lead on quite nicely to an oral antral communication which is you know communication between the mouth and the antrum but you know that can happen in other dentition doesn't yes. necessarily have to be a molar tooth you know i've seen it in a premolar and again it's all about looking at the radiograph preoperatively Absolutely. and predicting that likely complication mm-hmm. um now i think if it happens and if you've got the skill then you want to close that oac if yeah. in and this is just, I don't, you can tell me what your advice would be. If you take the tooth out, look in the socket and think, mm, not really quite sure. I, I certainly wouldn't do a Valsalva because I, just personally, I think if, if the lining is intact and you do a Valsalva, then you'll certainly create an OAC. Um, if, if you're not sure, I'd probably do an antral regime. I think um, that's fair. Um, yeah. I, as you know, if you put a, a sucker, um, so um, yeah, nurse can give you the sucker and you put your sucker up into the tooth socket but not too far you will get a very distinct note when you actually threw into the antrum um, it changes it sounds hollow it's very obvious when it when, the first time you hear it you'll, you'll know what it is um, I if I'm not sure then I'll stop the nose blowing I will um, mm-hmm. I'm give them antibiotics i may just stop the nose blowing and of course if i take an, any upper molar tooth out do you put that in your warnings for your uh, consent yeah. form yeah yeah routinely um, so and i will tell the patients i'll say listen although i don't think there's a hole if i don't think there's a hole it's possible that you could blow this through because it might just be a very thin piece of bone or possibly even a piece of mucosa or a piece of antral lining uh, and i think it's reasonable to say don't blow your nose um mm-hmm. The other thing I will do, do you, do you use any of these collagen dressings, these things for maintaining bone height? No, you know what I'm going to say yeah. that I put in? PRF. I, well, of course, you, you've got PRF. I haven't got a PRF machine. Well, buy do. yourself one. Treat yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have the likes of Colocone. Uh, and in the upper six or upper five 
wherever in the upper uh, where you think mm, not sure do you know what I, it, it gives you a little bit of stability to your clot hopefully although I can't say that it prevents a dry socket because a collicone doesn't um, but I think it gives a little bit of protection to that socket yeah. if I'm not sure I will never if, if I if I am um, um, see have a situation where I don't think there is a uh, an OAC then it's not going to get any extra stitches uh, I'm not yeah. going to raise the flap for that I will only raise a flap when I think there's definitely a hole because it's mm. actually quite a thing to do. Patients get quite bruised and battered after a flap sometimes. And, uh, and I know some people recommend putting Surgicel in to, to help, uh, help the clot form. Now, my only worry with that is that the Surgicel might end up in the antrum yeah. and you might be in more bother. So I think, and I know people have argued with this till like, with me, and I think if you if you dead set on putting surgical in i would suture it to the edges of the wound to make sure it doesn't go up into the antrum but that, that, that's that's my worry uh, i think it's unlikely to go up into the antrum i think that would be you'd be most unlucky if that happened the other thing i would say about suturing is it, it turns to jelly pretty quickly it, so i think you'd be suturing a, a piece of jelly um mm. and i think if i was going to encourage you to stick anything in there i'd be going down the perhaps something like collicone, one of these little collagen dressings would be yeah. better than Surgicel. Um, and uh, Surgicel, I, it's just not very stable. You, at 24 hours, it's often hanging out of sockets, isn't it? Like yeah, yeah. String. Stringy, so, yeah. Yeah, it's just, and the patients don't like it. So I, I wouldn't be going down Surgicel. I have seen somebody pack a socket. We were talking about Alvagil earlier. I have seen somebody pack a socket with Alvagil where they thought there was an OAC and that did end up in an antrum. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, it's not, that's not a preventative. That's a treatment. It's not a preventative. Yeah. And um, one of my registrars has got a good saying uh, for patients with a suspected OAC, do all the, you know, the no nose blow in, um, consider de decongestants, analgesia, maybe antibiotics. You know, I think you need to have a good reason for that. But also he says to them, just sneeze like a horse if you need to sneeze. Yeah, I, I, I tell them that they have to sneeze in the revolting way. So it's, yeah. it's sneezing. Um, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say this. Um, if you're out in a field and you're on a walk, you don't tend to get your hanky out. You just let it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Judith, people don't have handkerchiefs anymore. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and leading on from OAC, OAF because often people get confused. So the OAF is a fistula. So it's that epithelial line tract where it's tried to heal and hasn't. And certainly for those, well, I, the other thing, an OAC referral, it's not life or death. It doesn't need to happen the same day. We often get phone calls. Yeah. And, and I feel sorry for these guys because they feel bad for their patients because yeah, they've, yeah. The teeth out, they've made a hole. And then we say to them, well, I'm sorry, it's not an emergency because sadly it's not. Yeah. Uh, it's annoying. Now, one thing they could do for the patient to actually get the patient um, comfy is make them a little cover plate. Yeah, if they make indeed. Them like an Essex, then they're, then they're going to stop um, food and debris and rubbish getting up into the antrum. Yeah. And that would probably reduce their risk of infection. Um, yeah. so that's something to consider, but sadly we can't treat them as urgents. And, and just while we're on that, the other urgent referral we get is a root in the antrum. Oh, yeah. Well, and again, what do we do with those? We used to go looking for lots of them. Uh, in the olden days, we do lots of cold well looks. Now, a cold well look sounds like a great procedure, but the antrum is... Um, well, it's not that easy to get roots out of, or implants, out of um, uh, no. uh, <laughs> the antrum. It, it's it's quite difficult to get them out. And you actually need something often that's got a, a an angle in it to get it out. Um, so, sadly, roots in antrums aren't urgent procedures either. Um, yeah. And it's a curious thing that often patients will settle. Um, yeah. And just out of interest, have you got ENT colleagues that will go in endoscopically? Yeah. Um, however, <laughs> I know they've got the scopes and occasionally I can persuade them to do so. But by and large, they say if there's no evidence of obstruction, no evidence of infection, yeah. they'll leave them where they are. Yeah. And yeah. we have had a patient actually um, blow one out when he blew his nose. Oh, lovely. So basically, it managed to work its way up to the osteum, through the osteum and came out in the natural Shut out. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, not very nice. Big osteum yeah, well, or small yeah. roots. I don't know. I may have been a previous sinus patient, so it might have had oh, a previous okay. sinus. Yeah. 
Uh, and I guess the, the the thing with the fistula is again onward referral, and we'll excise it and um, and close it appropriately. Do you um, do you always send that off for histo just out of interest? I don't. Okay. Um, but I would do if I thought there was anything unusual about it. Sure. Don't forget, most of the fistulae that we see are—they uh, don't have any horrible granulations in them. They are just little holes. Uh, yeah. If I saw anything that looked like it looked unusual, um, I would send it off. Now, just occasionally, you'll get somebody who produces a little polyp that comes through the uh, antrum, um, so through the fistula. Have you ever seen one of those? Mm, uh, it yeah. looks like like a socket that's healed with a blob yeah. sitting in the middle i would send that away yeah okay well okay so nerve injury we'll finish on this um so again it, it's not common i i'm well i'm going to say that in the loosest sense of the word we do see it don't we but i think perhaps we don't see permanent nerve injury as much as um i don't know do you, do you think I don't think we see very much at all, but I think we see, I mean, let's face it, I, I, I'm sad to say I've been around long enough to remember the nice guidance coming in. So when I was a junior on the, the wards many years ago, if you had wisdom teeth, you're left without them. It sounds glib, mm. but that's pretty much what we did. So I've seen the transition between um, pre nice guidance and post nice guidance so i think we see fewer patients with nerve injuries and that's a good thing but i think we see a lot more patients with complications re resulting from retained wisdom teeth yeah um, yeah and that would reflect the most recent guidance would it not yeah sure um, and you know nerve injuries can be caused by all sorts of things yeah. is that argument about local anesthetic uh, yeah. and again you'll never know if you've given an id block what's caused it whether it's the needle the solution mm -hmm pressure and we could talk about that all day um <laughs> third molar removals um, sorry i was just about to ask you a question about it but Go i think I know the uh, when you do a lower third molar i think you are local infiltration now not idb is that i'm articane all the way join the club and i think it was you that convinced me actually in the good end. Right. Yeah, well, that, that's my time at King's, I'm afraid. Um, but, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. I appreciate that. But I think those patients, um, particularly in primary care, where they've sustained a nerve injury for wh whatever reason, um, I, and I think, I can't remember if it was earlier this year, it was end of last year, I think, in BJOMS that we published um, a survey of uh nerve injury management in the uk and and basically the outcome of it but i'll put a link in the podcast is is that it, it's poorly managed or people don't really know what to do and everybody's doing something different there are certain centers in the uk that that specialize in nerve injury management but certainly those when you refer to your local max fax unit you know w when should you refer um, and what should the management be really because certainly if you listen to some of the the literature in the states they're like hit them hard with steroids early anti-inflammatories B12. Yeah. Uh, they've got all sorts of clever things. I think the Americans are actually much, they're much more organized with it than we are, I think. Um, yeah. What if somebody would contact us and say, I've got a patient that I've taken a wisdom tooth out of and they are numb, I would see them the same week. Yeah. Uh, they are to me way more urgent than the oral communication or the um, root in an outrum. Um, and, and would you CBCT them? Yes, all of them. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's beholden, I mean, it's beholden on us to make sure that, that we know what's happened to that canal. We know whether there's any roots or bits of stuff around or bits of bone, for example. Um, I, I think it's important that we know that. We've, we've got good access to CBCT, as indeed do you. Uh, and I think it's important that we do that. The difficult bit and the bit where it falls down is what happens to the patients after that. So although we might see them urgently, there are times, as you know, where patients, it'll be, oh, we'll come back in six weeks and we'll see how it is. When in actual fact, our colleagues uh, in the trigeminal nerve uh, in repair units want to see those patients soon. So there's a very nice, um, I think I've seen this, I think you've sent it to me. There's a very nice um, flow chart from Sheffield about what yeah. to do and when. And I would yeah, all try and follow that where possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, because the sooner they see them, the better the outcomes are likely to be. Yeah.
totally agree. So just to finish, Judith, top tips? Top tips. Um, I, as you know, have this thing about future-proofing. So um, by future-proofing, I mean thinking about what's going to, what you're going to do if it all goes wrong. So what are you going to do if it starts to bleed? What are you going to do if you can't get the tooth out? So it's about preparation and planning. Uh, and that sometimes is about imaging. It's sometimes just about taking the correct history. And if you're not sure, don't do it. Does Definitely. that sound Yeah, totally agree. And th there's very little, certainly in oral surgery, that's same-day surgery, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it can usually wait. It's usually elective. Um, obviously, in a hospital setting, that's different. But There are always people out there to teach you, to help you. I'm always happy to go to practices and teach people. I, I, it's what we do, as you know. And um, there's no need for people to do things that they're not happy to do. Uh, and they shouldn't have to do these things. Um, we're always happy to teach. Okay. Uh, now, having said that... Um, as you know, also from your PhD work, we see a lot of very routine exodontia coming into the hospitals these days. Uh, and I think if we can be there to offer a bit of encouragement, then I would rather do that than inconvenience the patients and send them into hospital. So, and I think our dental colleagues are a lot better than they think they are sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Super. Well, it's been brilliant. Thanks very much for your time, yeah. Judith. And um, we'll chat soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast and any resources will be linked in the description. Please do leave a review and rate the podcast on the iTunes store. I hope you join me for the next episode. Goodbye for now.